this is Ricky Spence and welcome to another Quest by Community. Today we're going to really deep dive into everything about housing, especially for those of us in our golden years. What does it look like? What are some of the things we need to consider? And I remember about a year ago I was reading a really interesting report which was um, undertaken by Housing for the Age Action Group out of the closet out of options, which really highlighted some key findings about what it's like for people from the LGBTIQ community trying to navigate housing security and affordability. And interestingly enough, what was found is that there are many gaps. We've highlighted them before on Ben TV where we talked about the challenges for transgender, gender diverse and people who are older and living with disabilities. Today we are lucky to have Fiona Waters here with us, who is a social worker with Housing for the Age Action Group. Welcome, Fiona. Hello, nice to be here. When I was reading the report, just how much we are at risk when we are from the LGBTIQ space of being homelessness, that we can be kind of one paycheck or one uh, pension away from homelessness. So tell us a little bit about your involvement yeah what got you excited you're so young yet you're <laughs> you're working with um people my age and older so i i did a social work degree and uh, my first placement uh, student placement was actually with hag um and so i kind of went into social work not really knowing i guess what area i wanted to work in i thought i'd i guess i thought the kind of cohort I'd work with would pick me and that's kind of what happened. Um, so I did my placement at HAG and I just uh, worked in the intake team um, and then applied for a job when I finished up the placement there and I've been working there since. Um, so I think I just really enjoy working with older people um, and then I did my thesis on older people in this climate change space and how social workers engage with older people in, in terms of climate change and how they're framed. Coincidentally, I thought I'm going to diversify and try and get my second placement, um, maybe to have an experience working with a different age bracket or different group of people. And then I did a placement at the um, Dental Health Services Victoria. And they said, we've got this project we think you might be interested in that's about oral health for older people. So I think I've accidentally specialised, but I really love it. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. And also I have a personal investment in becoming an older person. So I enjoy working with older people now but also everybody regardless of what else you know however else they identify um i guess i would say most people would like to become old and have a house and have a happy life and it was interesting reading your bio fiona and you have an interesting title your, what's your title and what does it mean i think i'm one of the people at hag who's worked in the most different teams at the moment i'm working as a care finder so um, that kind of work is around assisting people who want to access the aged care system and might have some barriers um, or be isolated and not know how to do it, um, navigate it without some support. Um, and also alongside housing, because I guess HAG's focus is on, I guess, finding long-term housing for older people. Um, so I do that kind of work with um, doing kind of one-on-one -on -one client work, but also going out and doing information sessions to um, older people in spaces they already spend time in. So like seniors groups, any kind of any space where people spend time and would like to know more about it. And also we do professional um, information sessions. So we'll go to workers meetings um, and we can talk about what that means. Um, mm. And I also facilitate um, two working groups for um, one's the LGBTQIA plus reference group, which Ricky, you're a part of, um, which is how we met. And um, the other ones for people who live in retirement housing, so uh, retirement villages and residential parks um, to kind of, uh, I guess, campaign on big picture policy change to change the system and not just do the Band-Aid solutions of providing people a service without trying to change what means that they have to come to us in the first place. So let's start right at the beginning. Uh, for those people who are listening, what is HAG and what sort of services does HAG do? So HAG is Housing for the Aged Action Group. It's a member-based uh, grassroots organisation. Um, it originated, um, I think it's our 40th anniversary this year. And so it started out as a group of older people who were a group of tenants um, who were doing kind of, um, yeah, grassroots campaigning based on their experience of, uh, I think, of, a, of an eviction. And so over time, it's just built up and there's become, um, we've got um, state and federal funding mm. to run the service. Um, there's an intake service and outreach service that supports people 
who to access long-term housing options. So generally that's social housing, public and community housing. We also have a retirement housing service, which I used to work in, um, which supports people who are not eligible for public and community housing based on their income or assets um, to find other kinds of affordable housing options for older people. Also, if people are already in that kind of housing and are having a tenancy issue, so they might be having a problem with maintenance not getting done, their management isn't responding to their messages to resolve things, um, any other kind of dispute, we can provide um, support and advice on that. Um, we're not lawyers in that team, mm. um, but we're trained in the areas of law that cover that kind of housing. Um, and then there's the care finder workers, which assist people to access aged care and housing in tandem and any other services that they might need. So if someone called up and wanted help with gardening and also was in a rental and then also thought I'd love to join a walking group and I'd also like to see a psychologist, then the care finder workers would kind of work in tandem with that person to work on all those things collectively. So it's like a wraparound service. Yeah, so it's kind of people can come to us and if we're not the service um, because there's other services that provide similar programs to us. Mm. If um, we provide different services in different areas, depending, but we also, I guess, if people call us and they're not in a region that we can cover, um, then we can refer to the right place so people can call mm. us. And even if we're not the ones that provide ongoing support, um, we can link with the right people. I've noticed that working there that um, often lots of services or um, don't know that HAG exists or don't understand exactly what we do and I guess all the, the parts we cover. And so I've noticed, especially in the retirement housing team, when I was working there, often people would call us and be like, I've called everywhere and um, like, I didn't mm. know that you existed until I'd called 10 other services. So it's sort of like a, not an easy thing for an older person to have to face. You know, for many of us, we grew up in the era that there was so an abundance of housing, you know, renting, that you could find a place to rent. There was always spaces to get. There wasn't much demand. Whereas in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a real shift and changes. And I think one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, what is homelessness? And, and what are some of the risks that can put you in a situation where mm. you may become homelessness? The way HAG sees homelessness is, I guess, sometimes in the media people see homelessness as it might be someone who's sleeping rough mm. or something like that. But I guess we frame homelessness, especially in working with older people, homelessness can be um, living in a house that's overcrowded, living in a house that's unsafe for you, um, living in a house that's, you know, you're paying too much rent and so you have mm. to sacrifice other things in your life. Um, and, you know, it might be people who are uh, couch surfing with friends. Um, so you might, you know, you might be living in, in living in a house, but it's not your place, and there's no security of tenure, um, things like that. So, um, or often, um, you know, it might be someone who um, is sleeping in their car. So it's often older people, especially. Mm. Um, it's not seen, it's not visible, and I guess a lots of um, times the media around homelessness, um, it's often, yeah people that you can see because they're sleeping sleeping rough or um, other age groups are talked about. And I think especially with the um, LGBTQIA plus community, often when people um, talk about homelessness in that space, it's a lot about youth homelessness, mm. which is obviously a really massive problem and young people who are struggling, um, yeah, with finding housing that's secure where they can be themselves. But also I think it's um, often um, because of ageism in society in general, older people are forgotten as well. Um, and in terms of like the out of the closet, out of options report that you mentioned reading, broadly older people, there's risk factors for um, homelessness and housing stress, which is generally people who are living alone, people who are on a, um, in a rental and people mm. on a low income or a government pension. They're things that can be like risk factors for being in housing stress. And based on that report, um, older LGBTQIA plus people are more likely than the general population to be living alone, be on a pension and be in rental properties um, on top of, um, based on the, that research we did, um, more likely to be a carer of someone um, mm. and also more likely to have a disability. So other things that just um, aren't, uh, uh, I guess, when we say risk factors, we don't mean these are risk factors and this will happen. It just means they're things to be aware of. Um, that, you know, to be aware of what supports are available. So if you do need them, you know where to go. 
it's not like you're scrambling to find the right phone number in the crisis it's having the information so if something does happen you know where you can go for support and that's what i think um, i love about hag is that it's that one-stop shop where you can get information you know and a lot of the times i would imagine you know you mentioned you you were on the intake team you know where do you go and a lot of people feel anxious because when you are older um and you it might be difficult finding work and then you might get told that the place that you're renting is going to either go up to such an extent you can't afford it or they're going to sell the property and you realize where do i go what does it look like if what what are the steps involved if someone was to ring up hag today and they're listening mm. or they have a friend that's sort of in in, in a situation that might be in a housing crisis mm what what's the process and what does it look like we're pretty flexible with how people make contact with us first and also i guess from my experience working like with the report and working with the reference group that you're a part of um i guess lots of people have different um things that are going to make them feel safe to make contact um, i've noticed when i've had people who are members of the lgbtqia plus community mm -hmm. contact us some people only want to do texting some people prefer a call other people only want to do face to face because they want to build that trust. And I guess acknowledging, I think, um, especially at working at HAG as well, is thinking lots of people who are older members of the community um, who maybe have been discriminated against, mm -hmm. have found it really hard to access services in the past, have been turned away, um, have had, you know, yucky comments about their, um, you know, orientation, their gender, how they look, um, mm -hmm. how they live their life, what their family looks like. Um, I guess, you know, life and relationship structures that um, people, I guess, society sees as, you know, not heteronormative. Yeah. I think acknowledging that um, everyone's going to need a different, what's going to make someone comfortable. I was thinking, as you're saying that, HAG is only one of two housing organisations that had the rainbow tick accreditation. I'm pretty, last time I checked, there's, we're one of two who've got okay. the accreditation and I what does that mean, like in terms of housing searching, what having the rainbow tick accreditation mean? I guess it's about um, making sure that the service um, in terms of like um, how our committee of management looks, how our policies are written, how our staff leave is, you know, st our staff um, like job descriptions are written, uh, people's leave entitlements when they work at HAG, the service we provide, how we ask people about their um, pronouns, their name, um, things like that, just to make sure that it, it's um, culturally safe and mm -hmm. that um, people feel comfortable accessing the service and know that they're going to be respected and treated well and not have to worry. Yeah, I guess it's to build trust and show that HAG as an organisation has a commitment to being um, there for the community mm -hmm. um, and show that, yeah, to show that. And I, it goes from like, you know, how someone's treated when they call us to mm. how we make big picture decisions to how we write submissions and make sure that we include the voices of older LGBTQI plus people in policy, you know, when we speak to decision makers, making sure that that, so it's kind of about um, when people, I guess, you know, when you think accreditation and the rainbow tick, you think like I thought, it, you think about like ticking boxes and it being kind of a bureaucratic process, yeah. but I see it as like, it's about infusing that in how, we run mm -hmm. and it's about having the community reference group that we meet once a month um so it means that it's an opportunity to make sure that we're operating well and we're not just seeing the accreditation as a tick and move on yeah and the, one <laughs> of the things that came out of that space and i remember we've had a lot of discussions and i've had a few people um reach me during the week to again to ask you this question is what do you do when if you are somebody who is trans and gender diverse mm. and you may not have any documentation or all the documentation to affirm who you are say so, and you wanting to apply for rent or go on a mm. the housing wait list for community or social housing or public housing mm. is that something that a hag support worker could help someone with yeah so i guess what um it would be, I guess, case by case what that person wanted support in. So mm -hmm. um, how we generally work is we're going to, I guess, ask what the, talk through what the options are um, and then ask the person we're working with what they would like to do. So if it was about getting support to, um, you know, if, if your documents don't match your 
you know, your gender, mm -hmm. it says another gender that doesn't align with you. Um, I guess we'd be working with making sure that we're working with the person about what they want and also contacting specific services if it's something outside of what we have we have knowledge in doing. It's about collaborating with, um, yeah, collaborating and making sure we have the right information to assist people to apply for housing um, in a way that I guess means that they're going to, I guess being pragmatic about like we want to get the housing, but mm. also making sure we're not doing it in a way that means that that person feels like they're not being seen mm. and supported for who they are. In terms of um, the ref community reference group, which is wonderful, can you tell us a little bit about it? Mm. Uh, and if people were listening um, and they were really keen, they'd like to be involved in it, how would they become involved? So the reference group um, kind of came out of the um, the project when we were getting the rainbow ticket accreditation, um, we started a project which included the research, um, yeah, how going through the accreditation process, um, having a steering committee where we um, meet, meet with peak bodies um, in the space, so um, like Switchboard, Thorn Harbour Health, um, VALS, Ageing and Aged Care, and uh, LGBTI Health, mm -hmm. and another one, oh, um, Australian Gerontological mm -hmm. Association. Yeah, so meeting with them to make sure that how we're operating is also aligned with how other peak bodies in the space mm -hmm. talk about things. Then we set up also a working reference group of older LGBTQIA plus people from diverse backgrounds and identities to make sure that we're getting a representative perspective on decisions we're making too. Um, so that group meets monthly. Um, I've been facilitating the group for two, two, almost two years now, but it was started initially by another worker, Rebecca, who set up the project and did lots of the accreditation work. Um, yeah, so we meet, meet monthly um, and I guess I support the um, what HAG is doing in the space and also what the group wants to do to feed back to HAG about what's important in terms of mm -hmm. ways to engage community, spaces to go to, um, what support people need to, you know, if we're doing community information sessions mm -hmm. and members of the group are presenting, supporting them to feel comfortable with the presentation, presenting in a way that they feel good about. You get training. That's the thing I wanted to mention. Mm. That I remember that um, I, there was myself. I was a bit nervous, and I thought, "Oh, what am I going to say? How am I going to say?" It? But you actually provide that sort of professional training for people. Yeah. So I think I also went on a tangent then. So the, um, the second part of your first question as well. I guess people can um, to be a member of the working group. You need to be a member of HAG, which is free to join. And if you join, you get um, invites to our general meetings and e bulletins and um, information about. Um, yeah, what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, ways to contribute, um, because we're a member-based organisation too. It means that when we have big decisions, then all members can vote on it. So you have a way to kind of actively be involved oh, in how okay. um, HAG operates. Um, and then also within, there's the general membership and then there's the working group. So there's the LGBTQIA plus reference group. There's a culturally and linguistically diverse reference group. Um, the Retirement Housing Reference Group, which is the other one I facilitate. There's a National Alliance of Seniors Housing Group. So that's people across Australia being involved um, and other kind of spaces that you can participate in like a more specific kind of cohort. Um, so when you sign up to be a member, you can also be involved in those and kind of register interest. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, the reference group, the LGBTQA plus reference group, is that capacity, but we've also been talking about ways that we can make make there be a broader community within mm. HAG um, to do that too. So we're in the process of redoing the terms mm. of reference to make sure that there's a process about who's on the kind of um, core group and who's on the general group for that. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I guess we're looking to connect with people so we have a really, um, yeah, good range of people and like a dynamic conversations and new vo voices and old voices and things like that. So I think that's what I really love about it too, is it's mm. really flexible and everybody in the group is really invested in being involved, but also is really willing to share the space and welcome new people and yeah, make sure that the group's evolving within HAG, which I think is really, yeah, that's why I, I love being a part of it. For some of us with a number of disabilities, it's hard to travel. And mm. although HAG is centrally located in the CBD, I love the fact that we can all meet up online. And f the fact that we can meet up online, if there were people listening that perhaps lived out in, say, Shepparton or other parts of regional um, or remote areas of Victoria, would they, could they put in expression of interest? Yes. So we have, yeah, our offices in the city, 
but we do um, kind of do work in areas mm -hmm. and like have, I guess, funding for specific areas in Victoria. And one of them, we have like a, um, a pilot project that's um, up in Shepparton where we put a couple oh, of okay. workers up there um, who, yeah, go and do community education sessions as well. Um, so people can be, yeah, um, get in touch for like support, get in touch to be a member. Um, also all of our, like, like you said, in terms of our meetings are on a hybrid. There's an option to come in person or on Zoom. Similarly with, any, with our general meetings. So if you're a member and you live regionally, if you're a member and you um, need to stay at home for whatever reason, um, it also means that we like always worked hard to have a capacity to attend from home mm -hmm. or attend in other ways um, or participate in ways that work for people. Um, we're pretty happy to be flexible on that. And yeah, it's just a way that means that everybody can feel welcomed and join in. And I noticed that one of the things that HAG is really instrumental has been really capturing the current voices of people experiencing housing, you know, in terms of accessing and other aspects, you know, trying to get into re uh, support accommodation spaces. And I, you are running a survey that's not closed, but you're always looking to... Can you tell us a little bit about how people can become involved? Because mm. it's an open-ended survey, uh, which means it runs continuously. So what, what can people give you in that information? So the survey, just for like a bit of context, the survey, um, when we produced the out of um, the Closet Out of Options report, we did a survey um, to create that report. It was a mix um, of in-person and online and phone interviews. Um, about people's experience of housing stress um, and I guess what was happening for them at the moment mm. just so we could understand what that looks like for older LGBTQIA plus people. Um, there's um, for part of that report which you can find on HAG's website is got I guess information about how much research has been done in that space and it's pretty minimal like I think in there's like a, a gerontological journal I think there was 52 articles about older LGBTI people and housing mm. and only four of them were from Australia or New Zealand so there's just not mm. that much information on it and so it's hard to know what to advocate for if you don't know what people are going through and what people want and so we did that survey produced the out of the closet out of options report and that was in 2019 and so we want to see what's happening for people now since like post pandemic ish because mm. it's still happening um but I guess um what it's like to be in 2023 and with like rent increases, cost of living, um, all these things that we know older LGBTQIA plus people were already having, um, I guess, systemically a more difficult time in terms of this because of, you know, systemic discrimination and things like that. So I guess we're wanting to rerun the survey mm -hmm. now to say what's changed, what's different um, in that time period and what do we need to prioritise um, as, I guess, for HAG in terms of our service delivery, like, what, who, you know, where do we need to go to try and connect with people who need support and also how do we campaign with decision makers to make sure that the policies and the housing that's being built is actually going to fit the needs of older people but also specifically old LGBTQIA plus people who um, I guess based on the research are finding it harder to find long-term secure affordable housing. Um, so we've been running the survey, it's been open for a little while but we have significantly less respondents than we did the first time and so we want to make sure that we're doing uh, good good research and having be able to actually compare and we've noticed as well that there's less participation from people who are trans and gender diverse people who are over 65 and mm. also people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds we've got less participants than the first time so we're looking for anybody who's over 40 um, and wants to contribute um, to that the survey links on HAG's website there's a um, tab that's got all the information about mm -hmm. the LGBTQIA plus project, um, the group, um, reports, links, links to other services um, for the community um, and the survey there as well. So that's kind of what we're working on next is making sure that we have good data so we can actually have something to show to government and say this is what we need because this is what the community's told us. Fiona. Waters, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on uh, Quest by Community, and it really ha you really have showcased to all of us why it's important that housing is everyone's business, and especially for older people, um, which I'm a part of the community, and you will be one day. It's so important that we all work collectively together. Um, for those of you who are really interested, again, 
please reach out to Housing for the Age Action Group. There are key events throughout the year, especially with Homelessness Week, where you can contact HAG, have a look. Maybe you can give up some of your time, maybe participate, spread the message, get involved in activism. Fiona, it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a delight. I always love chatting to you. Thank you.